Hello, and welcome to Husbands Love Your Wives. Hey, thanks for joining us again tonight. And hey, Sam, here we go. This is this is going to be a neat session on, on a husband's kindness. I really appreciate you joining me. Oh, it's great to be here, Scott. Thank you for asking me. I'm looking forward to discussing this. Yeah, so, so you know, Guj, all the way through, you know, all the chapters we've done so far, he, he's pounding away at a really common theme. And it's really about how a husband, you know, manages his authority. God, mm. God gives authority to husbands. That's, that's indisputable. Of course, a lot of people hate that and they, 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 you know, say bad things about that. But this is God's design. And, but the problem with authority is it's either wielded well or poorly. So Guj is, is just continuing to help husbands understand how to take that authority and and use it properly in a, in a way that's consistent with Scripture. And there are a few things that are easy, to, as easy to, to distort as authority. And so, you know, Guj has, he just works, works from one issue after another. And of course, authority, it's not an unqualified authority. It's a governed authority. It's defined by the Lord Jesus Christ and, and his, his authority over the church. And not in every way, but in, in, in many ways. And um, so, so there it is. Any, any comments, uh, Sam, just before we jump into the text on this whole matter of this governed authority and, and learning how to manage it? Well, I think that's, that's the real trick in our day, isn't it? Because uh, on the one hand, there are people all over the place completely denying their husbands have authority right. over their wives in any real sense whatsoever. On the other hand, you have uh, then you have the tendency to become defensive about it. When we become defensive, then we tend not to manage our authority well right. and to be harsh and lacking in gentleness. In the way we manifest our authority and use our authority. Yeah. And he, I mean, he starts the discussion here right at the top on the whole matter of genuineness. If you look there at the top of 225, and he's he's talking about uh, this authority that operates both uh, in inwardly and outwardly in the same way. And he's talking about kind of the danger, you know, of, of living a double life and... Um, so he says a husband's conduct toward his wife must match his speech. And, you know, I, you know, it, it really brings out the whole problem that a husband, you know, bumps into when his wife says, you know, honey, I know you tell me that you love me, but mm -hmm. how come you don't act like it? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that, that is the issue. And of course, uh, what what Christian man in his right mind is going is not going to say I love my wife, right? But of course that statement commits him to a, a life that will back it up, and and that commits him to a course of conduct and cultivation of the things that may not be natural to him. Yeah, certainly aren't natural to his flesh. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. I, I tell my wife that I love her a lot more than I do things for her to show her that I love her. And hey, I'll be really honest. We've talked about that. My wife has talked to me about that. And um but that's that's what he begins this whole this whole thing with and it's the danger of a husband man uh w the husband that is in when his wife says you're all talk and no action. Right. I, I, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we and the, if we, we hear that we've got to step back and say okay, what am I doing wrong here? Yeah. Uh, I just assume that our wife is being oversensitive or too demanding, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then he gets really practical in the middle of the page there in 225 about, you know, how a husband does it. He talks about his facial expressions. And this, I, I mean, this is really interesting. He talks about the head, the brow, the eyes, the lips, and such other parts, you know. And, uh, uh, so he's just well, talking uh, about friend, friendliness, basically. I thought that I thought that this is why you asked me to read this chapter because I needed to hear that stuff. <laughs> uh, no, I, I have been told that my countenance uh, by friends of mine is not naturally friendly and inviting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told that. I, I didn't know that. I, I really don't recognize that. 
But so when I was reading this, I was thinking to myself, yes, I, I understand that a lot. And I understand that I really need to think about when I talk to my wife, uh, actively trying to express love, gentleness, and kindness. Because my countenance, my face doesn't do that naturally, I think. <laughs> oh, my. So I have told. Yeah. You know, um, so he's talking about this this friendly, cheerful disposition. In a way, it's it's like what happened, you know, when you were first noticing each other and you lit up, you know, whenever she was in the room. And she lit up whenever you were in the room. And it's easy to sort of lose that in the in the midst of children and troubles and all kinds of stuff like that. But I think he's really saying, you know, a husband... Uh, ought to love his wife by by really lighting up with his head, his brow, his eyes, you know, his lips, the whole thing. But here's here's a question. So he he lists all these things, and yeah. uh, so is is God really as detailed as this? Is this just an overactive Puritan mind, you know, adding to Scripture all these things? I don't think so. I, I was I was uh, convinced and somewhat convicted by this mm -hmm. because uh, I realized that. Uh, how I appear, what I look like, is going to be very, very uh, significant in terms of how my wife responds to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All we can, we can't see the heart. All we can do is see the face that reflects the heart. Right. I think Gouj uh, says something like, "As a mirror, as in a mirror, the face reflects the heart." And I think I, I said to myself, you know, look, I've got to remember. Not to, I, I gotta remember to smile and to actively express uh -huh. gentleness and love and, and the way I look at my wife and talk with her. Um, and, uh, and not allow uh, myself just to be the normal, somber, solemn fellow that I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, a guy's coming home from work and he walks in the door. Hey, this is what Jagu's just talking about setting, setting the tone of love. Remember, this is all about husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church. And so he's detailing these, all these practical applications. You know, I, I love the way the Puritans w walk through their practical applications. Hey, this whole book is one big practical application on that one statement in Scripture. And so he, they bring it right down to, to, to really, you know, fundamental practical uh, areas there. And he says, he says here that it helps... It helps a uh, it it helps a man uh, not to forget the intimacy that he has with her. That his authority is not absent of intimacy and right. and friendliness. Exactly, and uh, I just think it's really important uh, for a wife to have that. I mean, she should submit and respect and obey, just regardless, as yeah. the rest of the book says. But it's going to be a whole lot easier and a whole lot happier uh, yeah. if she realized the man that she's having to treat this way really loves her mm -hmm. and is expressing that. Yeah. And of course, as men, we're distracted. We're, we have our own problems and we tend to let them get in the way mm -hmm. of expressing this to our wife. Yeah. Even if the problem isn't our own sinfulness, it can be our distractedness or our heaviness with our own problems. But they don't know that unless we tell them because right. we have a problem with that as well. Yeah. And he, you know, is there something you said tripped, tripped something in my mind? A couple times here and in this chapter too, in, in some ways he's, he's kind of saying, hey, help the girl out with her submission. Love yeah. her. Be, you know, be friendly to her in face and head and all this kind of stuff. And uh, be, be a blessing to her in that way. Yeah. You know, I was struck at the bottom uh, at the of this page in 225, where he talks about uh, the face of God is is a kind face, and um, he, he's he's really arguing for uh, you know husbands being reflecting of the glory of God, and so but it's a kind face that the Lord has there and. And then he talks about, you know, a, a, a frowning face or a lowering face. This is on top of 226. Hanging the head down, putting out the lips and so on. Anger, malice, <laughs> grief, and other similar affections of the heart are manifested. 
And uh, yeah. so, you know, how do you love your wife? Well, you use your eyes and your yeah. and your countenance. You look at her, and you uh, you don't avoid looking at her. Of course, yeah, this is. I think isn't this part of what seeing your face is the face of God? God yeah. looks at us. He looks straight yeah. at us. Expresses love yeah. and kindness to us by looking at us. He doesn't turn away from us. Yeah, and that's the natural response if we've got a problem with somebody is to turn away from them, not look at them. Yeah, uh, and not not look into their eyes and their face. And I think so. That's one of the reasons I said before. Yeah, I don't have a problem with this at all. I don't think this is you know too much spirit and detail. I think it's expressive of a very important biblical truth in terms of the connection of soul and body and face and heart. Yeah. He uses a really a, a brilliant and beautiful image here. He talks about a looking glass. He says, uh, she beholds it as the face of God and as in a looking glass beholds the kindness and love of his heart and so has her heart more firmly knit to him and is moved to respect him more so those two images the the looking glass you know she's looking into a, really a looking glass of the kindness of God and mm-hmm. and it, and it knits her heart you know to him it's a beautiful image it really is um, and and you know I think it expresses a profound insight into a woman's psychology doesn't it because uh-huh. what a woman wants most of all is to be loved right. Uh, I mean, everybody wants to be loved, but I think that's particularly dominant in mm-hmm. women's life. Yeah. And it's expressed to her, it's powerful. Yeah. You know, and he, he moves on, he, he talks about physical affection, so not just your eyes and your the you know position of your head, but then he talks about affectionate gestures there at the bottom of 226. And yeah. um, so he's talking about, you know, touching and that type of thing. And... Um, he says that it stirs his wife up to be affectionate with him as well, and mm-hmm. um, but but then he talks about you know too extreme uh, uh, of affection. You see that you know yes. where it, you know like you know a couple that's first married they're sort of like all over each other. Well, that you know that, that can't last, right? But right. so what are your what are so, your thoughts so about that? You, apparently. Yeah. So what's the golden mean here? He, he doesn't really, he talks about being overheated, you know, in 227. Uh, but what, what's kind of the golden mean, do you think, in this whole thing? Yeah. Um, yeah, what is the golden mean? Well, I think he wants, I think it's clear that he wants, and we should, we should express publicly uh, uh, affection to our wife physically. In a, in a, in a, but it has to be in a restrained fashion mm-hmm. that's appropriate. It isn't embarrassing to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, because most women, at least after, after they've been married more than three weeks or a month, just don't want their husband all over them like that in public. <laughs> and so it's better, uh, I think it's clear that, I, but I think it's clear there should be some expression if, uh, if a husband and wife meet in public, a hug, uh-huh. kiss, I, when I come home from a trip and my wife meets me at the airport, well, I, I expect to be hugged and kissed, and I don't care who's looking right then. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, again, it's got to be restrained, and we have to be sensitive to uh, to other people and to and, and to our wife, who are, who may be very uh, sensitive about those things, maybe more sensitive than we are. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he, he, he moves from this whole thing of um, affection to sort of the opposite end, and that is a husband's coldness. That's dead center in page 227. And, oh, yeah. um, and he's talking about, you know, uh, treating your wife kind of like she's a stranger. Uh, and, you know, you, you walk into a room, maybe might be an example, and you, you notice everybody else, but you don't notice her. You don't go to her. You're ignoring her and it's it's a it's kind of a coldness yeah i once talked to uh someone whose father was a pastor and one of his complaints about his father was that he could be kind to all the other women in the church and 
much more kind than he was to his mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's a very striking thing. Now I'm not saying he was right or he perceived it correctly. Right. Sure, I don't know. But if it's true, it's really not the way it should be. <clears throat> and I know that we. It's one of the things I think he's saying here as well is we really have to be sensitive to our wife's feelings. And if and any sensitive wife is going to feel that if you're ex very expressive of kindness, love, and, and not mm -hmm. necessarily in any inappropriate way, mm -hmm. but if you're expressive of kindness and love to other women, but not to your wife uh, in that context, well, why is she not going to be jealous? And yeah. should not, even if we think, well, that's kind of silly, we should not give provoke them to that. Right. Yeah. You know, what's so striking to me about Guj and all the things we've discussed so far is that the, the tenderness of headship is, is so remarkably and, and really beautifully communicated. I mean, we, we live in an era where headship is, um, it, it equals abuse. And right. there's a lot of literature. There are all kinds of articles written about it. In fact, in fact, I think both of us have been taken to task for promoting abusive husbandry. Right. And and I think, you know, we, we really recoil, we're repulsed by that because we, we really do believe that this kind of headship is, is the kind that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of in Ephesians 5. So what, what, what would you say about that? Yeah, well, yes, uh, we both have been taken to task. I was I was surprised because uh, when I wrote A Man as Priest in His Home, um, I did it, in fact, to, yeah, in modern parlance, put a certain spin on male headship. Uh -huh. and, and a spin that was more a kinder, gentler male headship. Uh -huh. uh, because I was saying, look, Christ's central, central office, not his only office, not his only essential office, but his central office is his, is his priestly office. If he wasn't priest to us, he couldn't be prophet or king. Yeah. And so I was trying to say, we have to have a gentle, priestly manner in the right. exercise of relationship. And I was still criticized for uh, endorsing or promoting some sort of idea that would promote abuse when the reason for my writing the book was exactly the opposite remarkable that's amazing hey so i i mean i brought this book with me because i because <laughs> i wanted to talk about it man is a priest in his home this is a great book man i would i would really encourage you to get this book and um uh, you know one of the things that you say in here about a priest is that he's compassionate well we understand that from the book of hebrews and other places uh, yeah. But you know, you know, compassion is one of those defining qualities of a priest. There's, there's tenderness and mercy and compassion. It's it's just so loaded with, with the opposite of this hyper patriarchal jerk who's pushing everybody around. He's a compassionate high priest. That's that's right. And uh, and and the whole image of a priest is so telling and powerful to me because in the Hebrews five passage. It's clear that he has to he has to act with gentleness, a word that means measured passion. I think conveys the idea of a uh, of a careful restraint of even uh, of indignation for right, sin. Right. Uh, and it's also clear that a priest has to be in the exercise of his office selfless. Uh, the priest is about God and the sinner. And it's about uh -huh. God and the sinner. The priest is not not about himself. Yeah, you know, he says, no. it's about God and the sinner and trying to bring them together. That's mm -hmm. what a priest does. Yeah, and so I just think that image of priest priestliness is so important to keep us from reacting into uh, an austere or harsh exercise of our headship. Yeah, no, that's so good. You know, he uh, he talks about another application of of this headship and love and that is a husband giving gifts to his wife that's at the bottom of 227 so he gets really practical and he's saying you know actions are the most real demonstrations of true kindness in which a husband must not fail as he would have 
his kind speech, facial expression, and gesture to be received in the best way. And then he says, and it means that you should be giving gifts to your wife. So what have you given to her lately? I think that's the big question for the night. <laughs> Maybe there's going to be this big rash of gifts given, you know, to the, you know, to the, well, there are a whole lot of people listening. We think there might be a couple thousand people listening to this right now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so maybe, you know, gifts will be bought, the economy will approve, you know, and, and uh, wives will be happier. Well, it's convicting, isn't it? When was the last time I gave myself, my wife, a gift? Now, yeah. uh, I think I can think of that time, but, but the problem is, uh, one of the things I think about is, I give my, my wife a lot of gifts, I do a lot of things for her, but I enjoy them too. Yeah. I sense, in some sense, we're doing something together, and I enjoy being with her. And I enjoy having the evening with her. It's fun for me as well. So I have to, what's convicting to me is to ask myself, when was the last time I really gave her a gift that I didn't, that wasn't just as much fun for me as it was for her? Yeah, so I can think the, that gets more to the distant past, I'm afraid. So, you know, all those weed whackers and uh, books that you <laughs> gave her, you know, you're going to have to upgrade a little bit. <laughs> like I, I did clean the garage today, Scott. And you said you're going to do that before your wife comes home, right? My lo wife loves it when I clean the garage. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could say that's a gift to her. That is, a, uh, That would be a, a, a glorious gift to her. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> so then, you know, he, he talks about, I, I'm really amazed that he brings this up. Husbands beating their wives in the middle of 228 there. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, so husbands were beating their wives, and it seems like uh, we kind of get a sense of this later on. The laws of the land seem to allow it, uh, it more than it allowed even, um, you know, cruel treatment to servants and employees, that type of thing. But, you know, so he's, he's, he's saying the husbands shouldn't beat their wives. That sounds so obvious to us. Yeah. It's it's. But I, he's talking about violence in the home. Well, you know, I was trying to, I was trying to get my head around this too. Obviously, uh, in our day and age, it needs to be said. But, um, but what was striking? I was trying to think myself back into it, and you know what I thought of, Scott? I thought of Shakespeare's play, The Taming of the Shrew, and the scene where the guy is spanking his wife. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, my wife and I, that's one of the things we enjoy doing. If we can see the, the original kind of Shakespeare's play, we'll, we'll do that. We enjoy that. I remember once going to a, t the, a Taming of the Shrew uh, play, and some English professor was trying in her uh, introduction to the Taming of the Shrew to do something with it that was politically correct, <laughs> which was impossible. And it was really funny trying to read what she was saying to bring Taming of the Shoe into the 21st century. Of course, it was impossible. But, uh, <laughs> but the point is, yeah, so I guess uh, Taming of the Shoe, uh, you're just saying, no, the guy shouldn't have been spanking his wife, you know? Yeah. It's funny you used to say that. I was just talking to R.C. Sproul Jr. a couple days ago, and he was uh -huh. telling me that somebody on the Internet started this rumor that, that he, he promotes the spanking of a wife. <laughs> You know, I bet you made too too lavish a, a compliment for taming of the shoe. Or something, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I, I, I here here's sort of the summary. Don't spank your wives. I think that's what he's saying, right? And uh, I mean, he he uses some pretty, you know, pretty de demonstrative language, you know, to to really talk about this. But he 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 gives biblical reasons for it. You know, I remember I remember when I was a young man, I there was a there was a real fiery black preacher in L.A. I grew up in Southern California. His name was E.V. Hill. And he had this classic sermon. He starts it out by saying, the husbands, the men don't meet their wives in Sweet Home, Texas. And it's really, it's, it was a message about eldership. You know, uh -huh. the, the elders protect the flock. And one of the ways that they protect the flock is that the, the men don't beat their wives in Sweet Home. Because if you do, the elders are going to come after you. That was his whole message. It was great. Uh, Biblical I, eldership. Uh, <laughs> I performed this couple's marriage 
and she was the daughter of an African Methodist Episcopal minister, and uh, uh, and he was a they're young, lovely young couple, and I I actually went to South Bend to the AME Church to marry them, but the young man told me that. <laughs> that in his first two-hour conversation with this pastor father of this girl, one of the things the man said to him is, Melvin, in this family, we don't beat our women. And, of course, he was about six foot four, weighed about 260, and <laughs> listened to what he said, you know? <laughs> he, he, he must have been reading Gouge. I, it must have been, yeah. He had to have. You know, he, uh, he talks about, you know, arguments against it, loving your wife like yourself. You don't beat yourself is one of the arguments he uses in uh, uh, on page 230 there in the middle. But then he says that uh, those those who would do this, are they're, they're nothing of any higher level than idolaters and demoniacs. And they're, they're blinded and they're possessed. He says they're possessed with the devil. So he takes no prisoners. I was impressed by... This sounds strange because it seems obvious to what, us. Don't beat your wife, okay? Yeah. But I was impressed by his arguments. Actually. Right, right. The the fact that we're one flesh and you don't mm-hmm. beat yourself. Mm-hmm. The fact that our relationship with our wife is much more a delicate form of authority than with children who mm-hmm. we should train or right. servants, and that relationship is just entirely. Uh, entirely wronged by the right. notion of beating, the, beating your wife and things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. I just, I was really, because there's a lot of insight in those arguments and a lot of understanding and and penetrating look at what male-female relationships and marriage are, are like, you know? Yeah. And re- what he's really doing, he's arguing for closeness. He's arguing for the intimacy between a husband and wife. And, and you know, that type of thing destroys you know, the intimacy. Um, oh. So, uh, The dearer wives are, the dearer they ought to be to the husband, the more horrible must be striking uh, when it comes by a husband's hand or by a master. Mm. I just that, yeah, that's, wow, what a good statement. That yeah, is. yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I was just, I was really struck by how much uh, space he gave to this issue. And, you know, you hear, um, you know, domestic abuse is, is a real thing. And uh, maybe maybe we're here for the purpose of, of encouraging a husband to love his wife and stop and stop hurting her. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, he should be turned over the civil magistrate. I mean, uh, one of the, you know, one of the things that, you know, wives need to understand is they do have recourse. And if, yeah. they, if they are if they are being beaten, they should go to the elders. They, they they may ought to go straight to the civil government for protection. But wives often feel like you know because their husbands are an authority, the supreme authority in their life, they don't have any recourse, and that's 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 completely false. And wives you know should recognize God has given them other authorities other than their husband for their protection. You have these three authorities that are there. Uh, you know, a husband and uh, the civil realm and elders. God's given her protection on, on three levels at least. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, I, I agree with you, it's that it's monstrous to touch your wife like that. Yeah. Unless, unless and until the, to the un, unusual and vastly rare situation where you have to defend yourself right. uh, against your wife. But uh, it's monstrous. Yeah. To, to harshly handle her in any way, and a man should be ashamed of himself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and and it's and it's also the direct uh, direct uh, contradiction of loving your wife, because mm. as he says, there, there can no good come of it. No right. way of of mm-hmm. uh, your wife is going to promote love. It's only going to promote hatred, mm-hmm. and everything that's the opposite of love. Yeah. It's it's just remarkable. He he ta- he does talk about self defense. You know he talks about it if she becomes, you know, so forceful. What what he, what should he do? He says that he should first of all, you know, call the civil magistrate so that is so that's the civil magistrate's hand that touches her, and yeah. not his own hand. 
Right. So, I mean, here and what, and what we were saying before, God has said, thou shalt not kill. And I think uh, part of the exposition of that to read in other Puritan writers is that you can't uh, kill yourself. And that means you have a right to protect yourself from unlawful kind of harm mm-hmm. that's being done to you. And that means a wife has a right to seek the protection, and a man has a right, therefore, to seek the protection of the civil authorities, if necessary, from that kind of abuse and the possible uh, harming of one's life. Right, right. You know, so men, I, your, your wife may be violent toward you. And, and if she is, I think what Guj is saying is that if she is violent and, and you know, engages in harmful uh, behavior, then it might be better for you to call the police on her so that you don't have to defend yourself. And if you do have to defend yourself, uh, that, that may be a lawful response uh, to, to try to deal with her insanity. Um, but anyway, Goose is... need to get yourself to the phone to call the police, though. Yeah, right, right. Well, so, hey, this, the section that is, is really compelling to me in this whole chapter uh, deals with a husband bearing with his wife's weakness. And I'd really like to spend some time talking about this. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, at, at the top of page 233, um, he sort of makes a transition. He says, to this point, we've covered the husband's avoiding of offense. Now I will speak a word concerning his bearing with offense. So uh, he turns the tables and acknowledges that husbands have to bear offenses from their wives. And then he, he gives a lot more information about that. It's not just offenses, but, um, you know, and then he quotes Galatians 6, 2, that there's a general duty that's common to all men, but husbands are required to carry it out, and that is to bear ye one another's burdens. It just kind of a uh, an exegetical or exegetically oriented comment here. Guj is constantly going to general commands of Scripture and applying them to the husband and wife relationship. It's it's legitimate to do that. Um, just because uh, you know a, a section of Scripture is not directly addressing a husband or a wife in that specific context, doesn't mean that the principles and the commands don't apply. Any comments about this? It's just it's really an interpretive matter. Yeah. Well, I I think it's one of the things that is so attractive about the Puritans is their ability to draw from the uh, broad teaching of Scripture and say, don't you see that there's an application right here to the home? Uh, and uh, yeah, I just uh, one of the things you're impressed with when you read. Gouge and other Puritans is the, is the tradition of biblical interpretation. Mm-hmm. The wealth, the wealth and wealthy and rich tradition of biblical interpretation that underpins all that they say. And, and, and in, in fact, I think we have to be wary of that. Some things that we may read and some of the old writers may seem at first, well, that's weird. I don't see sure. that. Right. But it, the problem is, we're not working with and don't have under us that wealth uh, of the riches of biblical interpretation that that they had and were familiar with and did lead to, do lead to some of the conclusions, even though we look at the text and say, that sounds like proof texting. Mm-hmm. Actually, uh, when the text is examined in its broader biblical context, it has everything to do with the situation. Right. And I think part of the problem is we don't know our Bibles well enough, and our people don't know their Bibles well enough, so they don't see the connections across, you know, the the landscape of Scripture, and they can't see how it fits together. So they think it sounds odd when actually it does fit, you know, very well. By the way, just another another plug, you know, for your book, um, Sam. I I really like the way that you explained how you use the Old Testament. Uh, to to connect with New Testament categories for husbands, and uh, it's it's just it's very simple, very very well done. I think it's I think it's an excellent uh, example of the the continuity of the Old and the New Testament, and and what what is a lawful use of the law, as as Paul mm-hmm. talked about with Timothy. 
Thank you, brother. Of course, it's, there are a few things that are more important uh, in the interpretation of the Bible than rightly understanding the relationship of the Old and New Testament. A few things that a lot of evangelicals, especially from the influence of dispensationalism, mm -hmm. uh, have have got more to learn than rightly to uh, connect uh, the Old and New Testament. Right, right. Well, this whole matter of a husband bearing with his wife's weaknesses, um, he he identifies this this matter, he, and that there 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 is a weaker vessel. He says in this point number one in the middle of page two thirty three, of the two, he is more obligated than his wife, because in relation to his wife, he is the stronger, for she is the weaker vessel. First Peter three seven. But the strong are, are most obligated to bear the infirmities of the weak. So Guj lays a greater responsibility on the husband uh, for, for bearing with his wife's weaknesses. Now, remember, he started talking about bearing with his, your wife's offenses. Right. And, and what he's saying is because she's weaker, you have a greater responsibility. What are your thoughts about that? Well, first of all, of course... Uh, there are few texts of the Bible that are more offensive than the, in our day and age to the right. feminist crowd than the idea of wives being a weaker vessel. Right. Even though in many in many respects it ought to be obvious to everybody with eyes. On the other hand, <laughs> uh, and we ought to remember that uh, this is not necessarily demeaning to women to call them the weaker vessel. I have a friend who... Uh, illustrates it this way in preaching on First Peter 3. He says, so which would you rather be, the strong vessel, the old iron pot, or would you rather be the fragile china vase? Uh. I mean, which is more valuable? Which is more beautiful? Uh, and the, the stronger or the weaker vessel? Mm -hmm. I, 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 and I think that's probably true. Uh, we need to remember that we're old iron pots and our wives are uh, fragile, uh, beautiful china vases, mm. and we need to be careful how we, we treat them. <laughs> mm. So I think that I've always been struck by that illustration mm. because it so addresses some of the, the uh, what, what is it, the envy of strength, the wrong envy of strength that so, so uh, much mm -hmm. inculcates on women. Yeah. You know, so another thing that strikes me, though, Scott, is this. Um, I think men forget this principle. You know, we don't look at ourselves as these giants striding across the land right. with the earth thundering at our feet. Uh, I mean, that's kind of a, a dramatic image, isn't it? <laughs> Up into our homes, uh, and when we and, and we have to remember that our deeds and our our words. And what we do, uh, our our giant life to our wives and to our children. Hmm. And when we forget that, we tend to become literally like bulls in the mm -hmm. giant. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I, I know something that I forget. You know, my wife may respond to me in a certain way. It may even be simple. Uh, and, but if I respond back, uh, and I might think I'm just responding tit for tat, but it's not tit for tat because everything I do and say is amplified by the fact that I'm the, I'm the man, I'm the husband, I'm the authority. And, and, uh, if a man forgets that, he's liable to sin grievously in all sorts of ways and, and at least be really insensitive to his wife and family. Right. I mean, and everybody knows it's, it's a wife's basic inclination to follow she she does want to follow and uh and and and, and when she and, and when there is someone there who loves her it's really really easy for her to follow and maybe that's maybe that's part of the weaker vessel uh element as well he mentions two things he says that you know like we just read he's more obligated because he's stronger and then he says he's obligated to bear patiently with his wife more than any other because of that close relationship which is between them. He that cannot bear with his wife, his flesh, can bear 
with nobody. And so he's, he's obligated because of the closeness that God has called him to. Mm. What, uh, what page is that, Scott? I just yeah, want that, to look. yeah, that's in page 233. And you'll see in the middle of the page, number one and number two. I, yeah. I, was, I was reading each of those successively. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I think, and of course, it's so true. I mean, we are really patient with ourselves, aren't we? Yeah. Most of us <laughs> give ourselves a lot of slack. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we can explain why even things that we do that are sinful. Right. Uh, that where we have all sorts of reasons mm -hmm. to indicate the sinfulness of them. Well, I mean, they're our flesh. Right? We have to love them as our own flesh, as our own body. Well, then, certainly, the a measure with which we measure to ourselves ought to be the measure with which we measure to them. Yeah. In terms of being patient with imperfections and weaknesses that uh, tend to irritate the both of them. Yeah. Hey, you know, one of the men who's been listening to this asked me today, he said, how do you, how do you know the difference between uh, the situation where she's she really is the weaker vessel? How do you distinguish between that and when she might just be sinful and, and, and dealing with those two things differently? How does a man know that? Well, I mean, I, first and most obviously, sin is the transgression, and you lack of conformity onto a transgression of the law of God. So if what she's doing is that, uh, then, yeah, it's sin. Uh, even there, uh, there's room for, as he's going to say, isn't it? There's room for turning a blind eye to it occasionally uh, and not taking every word to heart. Right. But what I think what we have to say is sin is the transgression of the law of God. And and unless I can identify something that she's done as a clear transgression of the law of God, uh, just because I don't like it, just because it irritates me, doesn't mean necessarily that it's a transgression of the law of God, does it? Yeah. Yeah. So... That's the first thing I would say. There's probably more that could be said to it. Mm -hmm. Even if it is sin, there's room for bearing with the weaker vessel, sure. and that's probably just going to say. Yeah. You know, um, he he keeps talking about this well, this um, matter of the weaker vessel, and if you go to the uh, the top of page two thirty four, he 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 dissects different kinds of weaknesses. That a wife might have, and and of course, when you read the the list of weaknesses, you know that all wives don't have these same weaknesses, but but you might have you might have them on one wife or another. And he talks about there are these natural imperfections, um, you know, slowness of mind. There, you know, it's near the top of page two thirty four. Um, slowness of mind, dullness of understanding, shortness of memory and quickness in strong emotions and he's labeling those natural imperfections and 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 recognizing those in your wife yeah I, i'm just looking at slowness in mind and, and telling myself that it's seven o'clock seven o'clock in the morning before i've had my second cup of coffee <laughs> my slowness in mind my wife but nonetheless that's a that's, that's good to know that's a natural imperfection. Not yeah. A, a of the law of God. Yeah. Uh, but, you but, know, yeah. it's easier for husbands to get yeah. angry. Wives, aren't they? Oh, I missed what you just said. What was that? Well, these are the kind of things we have to learn about our wives. Right. And, and kind of be ready for. And, and I think he's going to say, not provoke them, not necessarily, but also not be provoked too quickly if we know our wives have a tendency in any one of these ways. We have we have to kind of train ourselves to say, yeah, that's that's her personality, that's her kind of emotional response to things, and we have to be ready to be patient with that. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and remind ourselves that those are natural imperfections, possibly, and not real transgressions of the law of God. 
Yeah. And, you know, you think of the things that he's listing here, the slowness of mind and dullness of understanding. Well, there, there are different ways that, that we can respond to that. Uh, we can respond in anger. Um, we can respond by uh, chiding. Uh, we can respond by saying, well, you know, why did I marry you anyway? You know, you can't remember a thing. Uh, and of course, Guz, you know, his, his whole argument is, is really based on on this passage in Galatians 6, 2, bear ye one another's burdens. Right. So he's really, he's calling husbands out of a harsh evaluation of their wives, even even in things that will surface for the rest of their lives. You know, if you have slowness of mind, you know, uh, you're going to live with that your whole life. If you have shortness of memory, um, you know, uh, the people around us are going to have to live with it. And I'm thinking about the people who have to live with that for around me right now, you know. Yes, that's right. Our people have to bear with pastors that way, don't they? Yeah. Uh, or quickness and strong emotions. The tendency, uh, tendency and of some people, women, to respond really strongly and emotionally mm -hmm. to them. Right. Uh, to be real sensitive of feeling and that, therefore to respond strongly. And, and maybe a woman like that's married to a man who tends to be, uh, really contemplative and, and, uh, the water doesn't boil too quickly. Right. And so, and he can really be, that can really be irritating to him. He's got to remember that's what she's like. I'm not like that, but she doesn't have to be like me. Yeah. And he, he drills down even deeper. He talks about, you know, outward imperfections, not just things like m memory and emotions, but he, he mentions specifically lameness, blindness, deafness. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then he says there in 234, these infirmities should cause pity, compassion, and sympathy, and even greater tenderness and respect but no yeah. offense. Amen. Isn't that, that's a wonderful statement, isn't yeah. it? Oh, and, and because it's exactly the opposite of the way we tend to respond. Right. Well, and, and we say, well, I, that irritated me. No, it shouldn't have irritated me. It should have made you, it should have made you compassionate. Right. We just go forth our compassion, not our irritation. Yeah. Uh, but, wow. You know, we're and back, I, are we back to this matter of the compassionate high priest who uh who knows our weaknesses and who who carries us you know through our, our infirmities like that i think so Beaky and the book that he published on romantic love well, what's the name of that was done at one of your conferences yes like yes i forget uh, the exact name of it but yeah it's it's uh friendship and marriage that was like something that. like that yeah my wife and I really enjoyed reading that book, and yeah. uh, uh, I think it's a wonderful book. And uh, but one of the things he says in there, I think, someplace, is that even in terms of the way we think about our wives, we just have to train ourselves not to focus on certain things. Right. If there's if there's something about them physically that over time has been less appealing to us, over time and age has made, we just have we can't we can't focus on that. It's foolish to focus on that. And God, there's a God-given ability to focus on other things that are more pleasing. Hmm. Well, then, you know, he turns from these natural imperfections and and that, and then he, he, then he turns to actual transgressions and violations of the law of God. And this is really interesting here, um, you know, because he, he, he gives really specific advice here. He gives you five, you know, five ways to deal with this. And they're really they're really practical. But right there in the middle of page two thirty four, he says, "Actual transgressions are violations of the of God's law, such as are meant here, which most directly tend to His own disturbance and disadvantage, as argumentativeness, insisting on her own way, being picky, stubbornness. In bearing these, must a husband especially show his wisdom." in various ways. So now we're talking about stubbornness, pickiness. Um, hey, <clears throat> the difficulty here is when you have a, a wife who really is rebellious mm. and she hasn't fully grasped 
that the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, she doesn't understand the, the, the peace that comes from submission and, uh, and the help that it is to her soul. So now he takes on, what do you, what do, you do with these things that are in the realm of, of sin? And, and I, I really like the way that he, he plays this out. And he says, first of all, how do you, what do you do? He says, by using the best and gentlest means he can to cure them as meek admonition, seasonable advice, gentle appeal, and compassionate affection. So he's not saying ignore it, but he's saying use use these methods of wisdom. Yeah, this is a this is an application of Jesus' uh, uh, words of counsel and command about interpersonal relations. Mm-hmm. Father sin against you, rebuke him if he repent, forgive him. I'm glad he begins with this because mm-hmm. Uh, there's just no solution and no longevity in any marriage where people can't talk to each other about their sins and don't follow Jesus' commands to, to deal with one another. But what he's saying is do it in the most meek, gentle fashion as you can, especially if you're the man. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I mean, I, again, I'm just struck at the specificity of the advice meek admonition on seasonable service, you know, just doing it in the most possible, most gentle possible way you can. And then the second thing that he recommends is is here, by removing the stone over which she stumbles, by taking away the cause so far as conveniently he can, which makes her to do wrong. Mm. You know, what might be some of those stones that a husband could remove? <laughs> oh, good question. Um, well, let's see. The sins are being picky. All right. So uh, he may have clothes that she hates. Uh, she shouldn't perhaps get be picky, uh, but he might stop wearing the tie and the shirt she despises and what makes her uh, argumentative and bossy and t- telling her, telling him, you can't go out of the house wearing that. <laughs> uh, that would be probably sinful in some degree for her to do that. But he could, he could cut all that uh, off at the past just by saying, even though it's my favorite shirt, my favorite tie, mm-hmm. for my wife's sake, I won't wear it. Yeah. You know, there's so we could probably make a really long list. It could be a tone of voice. It could be a mannerism. Uh, yeah. It could be a thing that you do, being late for dinner. I mean, there, there, there are a hundred things that could probably be listed. But he's saying, remove the stone. You love her. Remove the stone of stumbling. Yeah. And then the third thing, which which is really surprising to me, by turning his eyes away, if the matter be not great but may be tolerated and taking no notice of the offense. Of course, he's not talking about serious sin here. Right. He's talking about matters that can be overlooked. And then, and then fourthly, by forgiving and forgetting, uh, forgiving it, if notice is taken of it. Um, so those are, those are four really practical things. But, mm-hmm. but then he ends it up by this uh, in, uh, in the first or the, the, the first main paragraph on page 235, he says, The best test of a man's affection to his wife and of his wisdom in ordering the same is in this point of bearing with offenses. And, um, you know, again, he's dealing with a weaker vessel, so he should bear with the offense. He says that's the very best test of love that you're able to bear an offense and respond not in kind. Yeah. Yeah, it's the best test of love, and it's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> to not be provoked and to uh, with, with things that are, are really sinful and offensive, to not be provoked to respond gently, kindly, and not have a raised voice when you're met with a raised voice. Yeah. Um. I just really, uh, uh, my wife often tells women, 
that submission is contested until you disagree with your husband. <laughs> right. And I think what he's saying here is love is contested until there's something that offends you. Right. And it's at that point that you see the degree of love. Yeah. He says... For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Of course, he's quoting Matthew five forty six, And then he says, Gently bear with and wisely pass over offenses when they are given, not to be provoked when there is a cause of prov- provocation given, is a true Christian virtue, a virtue fitting husbands better than any other kind of men. But So that's the best test, is when you are provoked but you don't you don't return in kind. And then he ends this whole chapter with it with another image. He talks about gunpowder. And and you know the idea is don't have gunpowder in your house. Get it out of your house. We kind of remove the gunpowder. And yeah. um, and he, he speaks of this in terms of quickness to anger, irritability and at, at, at the least provocation, he says there in, in the first part of it, in the, in the lower middle of page 235. But he says this, I, I thought this was brilliant. It is not safe to have the devil too near. And he's talking about the gunpowder of, 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 of a flashpoint of irritability. So there it is. You know, it, it's, it's about the, the kindness of a husband and, and his ability to recognize who he is. He is ahead, but but he also is the stronger of the two, and it obligates him to more gentleness, even than his wife. You know, this is a really striking image, isn't it? Uh, I think I can say this as my own testimony. Well, I, I didn't realize how much gunpowder was in my when I got married. Mm, I thought I was pretty tolerant, patient, right. lovable kind of guy. Oh my, did the first three months of marriage teach me the opposite of that. Right. And uh, showed me how much gunpowder was in my heart. And the, the, the trick, uh, the key, what we need the grace of God for is to take the gunpowder out of our heart hmm. without the giving up the headship and authority. Right. God is very, very well said. That's that's beautiful. And when when he spoke of the gunpowder getting it out of the house, I re, I was reminded of the getting of the leaven out of the house. The Hebrews would would scatter leaven in their houses and sweep it up the sin in the house, and they would take it out and they would burn the leaven. Mm. And uh, so it, it is for a husband to to clear the house of the leaven of the gunpowder. So, brothers, hey, let's let's consider what kind of gunpowder is still left in our house. Let's remove it from the house. Let's 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 be very clear. We are the heads of our houses, but there are obligations, and there there is a way that God has designed that we that we manage our headship, and it's defined in all these things that we've just read, and and perhaps you know Guj is right. The supreme way, the best way, to manage your headship. It's is is tested when you're provoked, and uh, anyway, what a beautiful what a beautiful chapter. I'm I'm so grateful for it. I appreciate the opportunity to read it and talk with you about it. Thanks, Sam. Hey, God bless you. And hey, thanks thanks for writing that book about uh, the priesthood and Job and and all that great stuff. God bless you. And hey, I I'd love to do something like this again. This was really fun. This has been great, brother. Thank you. Thanks. God bless. Bye bye. Bye bye.